Hello, my name is Miss Nicole, and I'm the Children's Librarian at the Hairston Crossing Library. Today, I'm bringing you a very special Tell Your Elders Stories program, which is all about the tradition of oral storytelling. Now, what do I mean by Tell Your Elders Stories? It's as simple as listening to a story from someone who's older than you, and retelling it. But before you do that, you need to learn a little bit about the history of storytelling and how to tell the best story possible. So let's get started. As long as there have been people, there have been stories. From stories told in paintings on cave walls to the bedtime stories that you hear as young children. Stories make up our history and help guide our future. Some stories have lasted hundreds and thousands of years and are still being told. Stories began with what's called an oral tradition, meaning they're passed on by being heard and retold. Later on, people began to write stories down but we still love to hear stories told out loud today. You probably have some favorite stories of your own. Maybe there's stories about your family that you've heard from family members. So what I want you to do today is talk to anyone in your life and ask them to tell you a story about them or their family. It could be a parent, it could be a grandparent, it could be an aunt, uncle, cousin, friend, neighbor, it could be anyone. Ask them to tell you a story and then you try to retell it. And how we're going to retell the story today is through something called a story mountain. A story mountain helps you tell the very best story possible. You start at the bottom, climb up the mountain, and then climb back down. So let's begin. Our story begins at what's called the base camp, or the bottom of the mountain. How does your story start? Who is in your story? What's your story going to be about? This is when you tell that. Next, we have to climb up the mountain. What happens on the way up? Are there any problems that they encounter? This is the time where you build up to the most exciting part of the story. After this, we reach the top of the mountain, also known as the peak. What's the most exciting part of the story? What part gets your heart thumping? What part makes you most excited? This is where you tell that. But are we done there? Nope, we have to climb back down the mountain. What happens after the most exciting part of the story? Did they learn a lesson? Did they try it again, but this time different? This is where you tell that part. Then we end our story on the other side of the mountain. How does the story end? What's different now? than it was at the beginning of the story. Now, I have some more tips for you with storytelling that I've used, and I think you'll like them too. So let's say you're telling a story and you have two different characters. You can change your voice for each character. You can have one character speak in a low voice, and you can have the other character speak in a high voice. That way, your audience will know which character is which. You can also turn your body in one direction and another direction to show that there are two different characters talking. You can also use hand movements in facial expressions or moving your face to help tell your story. I think I would be more excited to see someone who is excited to tell a story than showing it. Don't you agree? You can also speak faster and slower 
and higher and lower to help build anticipation in your story. You also want to make sure that you speak loudly enough for everyone to hear you and say the words clearly so everyone can understand you. So now that you know how to tell a story, I want you to tell us your story. Simply click on the Google link in the description box below. You can type out your story. You can draw out your story. You can record your story and send it to us. We want to hear all about your elders' stories. I'm so excited today to be able to share with you an example of the oral history storytelling tradition. We're going to explore the mysteries of the universe, the sky tellers. And these are Native American myths and legends. And today we're going to listen to one that investigates the reason for day and night. Each narrative includes the myth or legend, as well as a story that scientists tell today. I will have all the links for sky tellers listed in the description box below. Thank you. Night is coming. One by one the stars appear. Night is coming. And soon it will be time for stories. Long ago, storytellers invented magical stories about the sun, moon, stars, and the other great mysteries of the sky. The stories were not meant to explain these mysteries. Rather, they were told to help people pay attention to our world. Today, scientists use another way to help us pay attention to the mysteries of the sky. By observing, measuring, and predicting, they explain how the world works. And like the storytellers of old, today scientists can lead us to better know and care for our world. Storytellers and scientists are today's sky tellers, for they both tell us about the sky. And though each tells a different kind of story, both help us to better know our world and ourselves. Night is here. Listen now. This is the time for stories. In the beginning times, before time, the earth was different. It was a cold, dark place, and in that cold darkness there was much hardship. The plants could not find their way up out of the earth, and those little animals that need to eat the plants to survive sickened and grew weak. In that cold darkness there were sleek, fat hunters who could see well in the dark, and they hunted those little plant eaters. There were other troubles in the darkness. Animals clumsily stepped on each other and crashed into each other. Oof! Oh, get off my paw. That's, that's, an antler in my rib. Stop that. Ow! Oh. The birds argued with their own relatives, for some birds had eyes that could see in the dark, and they would spread their wings and fly, while their relatives could not see, and wings and quills were shattered and broken each time they tried to fly. At last the animals decided perhaps the creation was still creating. Perhaps the maker had forgotten to finish the making. And so they went to the place where the one who made all things lives, and they asked if something was missing. Could there be something more? Oh yes, I can give you light. It will be warm, it will be bright, I will give you a world of light. But some animals did not want such a world. The night creatures feared this unknown thing. We want no light. It was Bear who spoke for the night creatures. I like the dark. I want no light. Now the animals began to argue in front of the one who made them, until at last a small voice spoke. Um, couldn't we have both? It was Ant. Couldn't we have 
day and night, we will call it dark and light. Then there will be peace among all people, for everyone will have what they need. The maker smiled at such wisdom coming from such a small one. But the animals argued again about night, about light, until he realized this had to be settled, and it could only be settled by a dance contest. What else would be fair between an ant and a bear? The animals prepared for a great feast, all contest end in feasting, and Bear prepared as he prepares for everything. He began to eat and eat and eat until he was huge. He stood, I am Bear. I dance for night. I want the dark. I hate the light. I am Bear. I dance for night. Ant did not watch, nor did she eat. She fasted. She drank clean water and she prayed. When it was her turn to dance, she was dizzy from the hunger. She pulled her belt tightly and she danced for day and night, dark and light. She danced for peace among all people and that everyone would get what they need. Bear kept eating and when he stood, he was enormous. I am Bear. His steps shook the earth. The animals shook. He could not be defeated. I dance for night. I want the dark. I hate the light. I am Bear. I dance for night. And he danced and danced until hope was gone. Aunt did not watch. She fasted. She prayed. She drank clean water, and when she stood to dance, she was lightheaded and nearly fell to the earth. But she took her belt and pulled it tighter still, and she danced. For day and night, dark and light, she danced for peace among all people, and that everyone would get what they need. When Bear stood, now he was enormous. His belly was like a boulder in front of him. I am Bear. I... Uh, and he crashed to the earth and was snoring. Ant had won. She pulled her belt tighter so she could endure her victory dance, and she danced for day and night, dark and light. She danced for peace among all people, and that everyone would get what they need. And so it was. From that day to this, the earth is divided into day and night, dark and and light. And when we see the tiny waist of Ant who pulled her belt tighter so that we would have peace and what we need, we know that this story is so. Day and night, dark and light. Day and night, dark and light. When you were very small, one of the first things that you noticed about your world so sometimes it's light outside, and sometimes it's dark. Today, we ask astronomers to help us understand how day and night come to be. They tell us a story that is different than the tale of the ant bringing the light, yet it's not so different after all. The stars are out, and the night is the best time for stories. So it's a good time to hear a science story of why we have day and night. Long, long ago, people watched the sun appear in the east travel across the sky and disappear into the west. They thought the sun traveled round and round the earth, making day when it appeared and leaving them in darkness of night when it went away. It still looks like that's what is happening, but science has taught us that things aren't always as they seem. Today we know there is a day and night not because the sun is traveling around the earth, but because the earth itself is moving. The earth spins and its spinning turns us toward the sun, then away from it, giving us a cycle of day and night. We can see that this is so if we begin by using our imaginations. First, let's imagine an apple hanging from the branch of an apple tree. It's a sunny day, and we can see half of the apple. The half facing the sun is warm and bright with sunlight, while the half facing away from the sun is shady and cool. Now let's pick the apple from the branch and hold it in our hand. We have a long pencil in our pocket. We can take the pencil and stick it through the apple, pushing it in at the top where the stem is and letting it stick out the bottom. If we take hold of each end of the pencil and start twisting it, the apple begins to spin around. And if we hold the apple up to the sun, we can see that half of the apple is always sunny and half is shaded, 
but those halves change as the apple spins. If Ant herself were sitting on our apple in one place, she would first be carried into the sunlight on the spinning apple and then carried around back into the shade. The circling arrows remind us that our apple is spinning. Now, let's turn the apple into the earth. The apple's red skin becomes the blue oceans and the brown land of our world. And the place where the pencil goes in at the top, we will call the North Pole, and the place where it comes out the bottom, we'll call the South Pole. Of course, the Earth doesn't have a giant pencil stuck through it, so let's replace the pencil with an imaginary line. This invisible line has a name, and we'll call it the Earth's axis, a line around which our Earth spins. And there is one more thing we need to do. Our Earth doesn't stand up straight, rather, it's tipped over just a bit. Instead of Ant sitting on the Earth, imagine yourself outside looking at the sky. And now as the Earth spins, the place where you live will be carried around to face the sun and you will have daytime. The spinning Earth will continue to carry you around until you face away from the sun and are in the dark, what we call nighttime. The Earth is spinning around its invisible axis, but the Earth is very much larger than an apple and you're very much too small for us to see. But you're down there, and the earth carries all of us, people, houses, apple trees, ants, bears, turning us into the sunlight to give us day, and turning us away to give us night. Scientists call the spinning motion of the earth rotation, but you can think of it as kind of a dance. Just as ant danced to bring day and night, the earth dances too, spinning or rotating to bring day and night to all of the living things upon its surface. It takes the Earth 24 hours to spin around or to rotate once, and so every 24 hours we go through day and night. But the Earth's dance is more complicated than this, for as it rotates, it also circles around the Sun in a great loop in space. Imagine the Sun in the middle of a great blackness, and now draw a circle around that Sun. Now put our spinning earth on that circle and let the earth move along it. The circle is called an orbit and it is a path that the earth takes around the sun. We say the earth is orbiting or revolving about the sun. Now we can see how the earth dances in space. It spins around or rotates about its axis at the same time it circles or orbits the sun. It takes 24 hours to rotate and make one day and it takes about 365 days to revolve around the sun. So you see, even in the story of science, it takes dancing to give us day and night. But it is the earth that dances, spinning us to face the sun by day and turning us away from the sun each night. These stories help us to remember to notice day and night, dark and light, and why the world is the way it is. And sometime, when you're in a quiet place and sitting still, Look around and know that you and the whole world are spinning and that you are speeding through space on a journey around the sun. So sit quietly now and know that our earth is turning us toward the sun and day is coming. <laughs>